All right, welcome everybody. Uh, today we are delighted to have Professor Gon here to tell us about bounding regularity of OI modules. Thanks very much for the uh, invitation to uh, give the talk. Um, so I'm talking about a joint work with uh, Li Ping Li uh, on OI modules. Okay, uh, so uh, for FI modules, uh, there are these two uh, very useful theorems. So, so uh, one is the theorem by Church and Allenberg giving a bound on the regularity of an FI module uh, in terms of the generating degree and presentation degree. Okay, and then there's a very very useful second result by uh, Napa Napa shift theorem. Okay, so uh, I want to talk about um, the variance of uh, these two results for OI modules. So OI, um, OI modules appear uh, first appear I think in this uh, paper by Sam and Snowden on Grobner basis. Okay, okay uh, so uh, the category OI. Okay, so OI uh, is a category. Uh, objects of this category are finite, totally ordered sets. Morphisms are order preserving injections of order preserving injections. Okay, so finite totally ordered sets uh, with order preserving in injections. Okay, so uh, in this category OI, um, I'm going to write square bracket N for uh, the set whose elements are one, two, three to N. Okay, so order in the usual way. Okay, so uh, n equals to zero, one, two, three, and so on. Uh, and if sometimes I'll just regard, uh, so, 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 so these are collection of objects. Is a skeletal subcategory of OI. And sometimes it, uh, it's useful to just uh, think of OI as the category whose objects are n for n equals zero, one, two, three, and so on. Okay. Okay, uh, then I'm going to let K be a commutative ring. And an OI module will be an OI module over K. Okay. So why is an OI module? An OI module is a functor V from the category OI to the category of K modules. Okay, so an OI module is a functor V from OI to the category of K modules. If I have an object, X in OI, so X is a finite totally ordered set. We associate to X a K module that I will write as V subscript X. And in the case where X is N, I'll just write V N. Okay. Okay, so let's say V is an OI module. Now, so in this OI module V, I'm going to uh, define a OI submodule that I'll write as V less than N. Okay, so I've, I fix a natural number N, and then I'm going to define an OI module V less than N. This is the OI submodule of V generated by or the VM where M is strictly less than N. Okay. The OI submodule of V generated by all VM where M is less than N. Okay, then I'm going to define another OI submodule in V that I'll denote by V plus. Okay, so to define an OI submodule V plus in V, I will tell you what is V plus at N. So why is V plus at N? V plus at N is defined to be V less than N at N. Okay, so this is, a, this sits inside VN. Okay, so you think of it in this way, right? So you look at VN and you look at the uh, elements that comes from some VM where M is less than N. Okay, so the, the, the span of these things. Okay, and then you can check V plus is a OI submodule of V. Okay, and then we define H not V 
to be V mod V plus. Okay. So this is uh, a quotient of uh, OI modules. You get an OI module. So you get an OI module. So I think of H not V as an OI module and uh, H not is a functor from the category of OI modules to the category of OI modules. And it is right as that. Okay. So H not is a right as that functor. And you can take the left derived functors that we write that as H I V. Okay. H I V I from 0, 1 to 3 and so on. Okay. So these are the left derived functors of H not. Okay. So this is the OI homology of V. Okay. And then I'll write T I V to be the degree of H I V where the degree of H I V means the following. It is the supremum of all N such that H I V at N is non-zero. Okay. So it can be infinite. Okay. So H H I V is a, so, so, so this H I V is an OI module. So I look at this OI module and I ask, is there a biggest N such that it is non-zero? And then after that, it is zero. Okay. So that's called the degree. Okay. Uh, so then uh, the generating degree of V is T zero V, T zero V. Okay, the degree of H not V, that's the generating degree of V. And the presentation degree of V uh, is, I define it as the max of T zero V and T one V, okay. So, um, so I'm just uh, defining these terms, okay? So I'll call it um, T not V, the generating degree of V, and the max T not V, T one V, the presentation degree of V. And the definition of the regularity of V, okay? So this is the regularity of V is defined to be the supremum of T I V minus I for I greater or equals to zero. So by the way, uh, so the, I define degree of HIV as the TIV. It is possible that HIV is identically zero for at every n, and then I'll use the convention that the, uh, the degree is minus one in that case. Okay, okay so regularity of V, uh, supremum of TIV minus I over all I greater or equals to zero. Okay, now yeah, so if, if, if you are familiar with uh, the, uh, this, uh, set up for FI modules, it, it, so, so far it's completely the same, right? It's, uh, the definitions are complete, more, more or less the same. Okay. So then uh, the first theorem um, says uh, following, so let D be the generating degree of V and let R be the presentation degree of V. Then the regularity of V is bounded above uh, by a certain explicit formula in terms of D and R. The formula is two to the power of two to the power of D times R. Okay, so some very, so, so, so if you know the result for FI module is like D plus R minus one. Okay. So, so this is uh, much, 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 much bigger. But um, the, the point is that uh, there is, it, it, the, the point is that it can be bounded in terms of D and R. Yeah, so uh, I don't know how, how far this is from being optimal. It might be very, very far from being the optimal bound, okay?
Okay, so um, so next I want to uh tell you about the, uh the main tool that uh we use um to get this. Okay, the, the, so the main tool is uh the the shift functor. Okay, so the shift functor uh follows the same uh, definition as for fi modules. So on the category oi, you have um, a functor from oi to oi, where you send a finite totally ordered set x to x disjoint union with one point. Now, this is supposed to be totally ordered. I will make that extra point less than everything in X. So it becomes the smallest point. Okay. So I'll write, I join a point star, this joint union with X. And I will uh, put the ordering so that star is less than everything in X. Okay. So so so, so this defines um a functor from OI to itself. Okay. And now so 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 let's say you have an OI module V. An OI module V is a functor from OI to the category of K modules. So you can pull back, restrict to this or uh, pull, pull back by this, right? So that's the shift of V that we write as sigma V. Okay. So in other words, so sigma is the shift functor. Okay. So sigma V is an OI module and at the object X, it is V evaluated at a point union X. Okay. So that's the Xu functor. Now there is a natural homomorphism from V to Sigma V. There's a natural homomorphism from V to Sigma V. So to give this homomorphism, I need to tell you at every object, X, how do you go from V X to Sigma V X? But Sigma V X is V X star union X. So this homomorphism is induced by the natural inclusion from X to star union X, right? So I have a natural inclusion from X to star union X, and this induces a map from V at X to V at star union X. And that gives me the homomorphism from V to sigma V. Okay, so we have this homomorphism V to sigma V, and then we take the kernel, the kernel, we call it kappa V, and we can take the co-kernel, the co-kernel is denoted by delta V. Okay, so uh, in the same way as for Fi modules, we, we, I'll call this uh, functor delta, the uh, derivative functor. So delta V, we call it the uh, derivative of V. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so, um, so, so let's see what happens if we do this uh, for the, for a, so this uh, free, F, uh, free OI modules. Okay, so let me uh, first uh, describe these modules. Free, OI module, MD. Okay, so D is a non-negative integer. Okay, D is a non-negative integer. So I'll define this OI module MD. So I need to tell you what is MD at N. MD at N is the free K module. With basis, all the morphisms in the category OI from D to N. Okay. And then this has a OI module structure in a natural way because you can compose morphisms. Okay, so we call this uh, MD a free OI module. Okay, now let's see what happens if you shift MD. Okay. So if you shift MD, um, then you, okay, so you look at what, what you get at an object N. So at an object N, you are going to look, the shift of MD at N is MD at star 
plus star union n, the one one plus n, right? You get a one more point plus n. Okay, so then uh, you have a basis. Uh, so you had you, so this basis consists of morphisms from D to star union n. Now, so so you give a um, this injection, order preserving injection to star union n from D. Now, if so, so if this injection uh does not hit star, it does not hit star, then it's just just the same as giving an injection from D to N. Okay, so you get a copy of uh M D N in there. But other but but it's also possible that this injection actually hit the point star. Star is in the image of this injection. Okay. Uh, and so then giving this injection is the same as git. So because it's order preserving, it must be the, your the, the one in the set D that hits the star. And so your remaining D minus one numbers will have to go to N. Okay. So you get a copy of M D minus one in there. Okay. So this is and 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 and, and so you have this uh, isomorphism. Okay. So shift of MD is MD direct sum M D minus one. Okay, and then uh, when you take the um, derivative of MD, you have to take the co kernel from MD to sigma MD, and then you can see that the derivative of MD is MD minus one. Okay, so this tells us uh, the following that if I look at the generating degree uh, of sigma V, the shift of V, now so if um, so every OI module V can be written as a quotient of a direct sum of some free modules. Okay. And so the generating degree of sigma V is less than or equals to the generating degree of V. And the generating degree of delta V is less than or equals to the generating degree of V minus one. So if you take derivative of V, generating degree can go down. Okay. So we'll use that to do induction uh, to, to, to do induction arguments by induction on gen, generating degree. Okay. okay, so then uh, to use this, I need to be able to relate the regularity of V with the regularity of uh, sigma V and delta V. Okay, so there's the following lemma. Okay, so it says following. So regularity of V is at most the regularity of sigma v plus one and number two if kappa v is zero then the regularity of delta v is less than or equals to regularity of sorry there's a mistake regularity of v is less than or equals to regularity of delta v plus one Okay, now, um, so, so, so this is uh, actually completely the same for fi, if you know fi, but I want to say a, a few words about the proof, because uh, then you can see where, why kappa v equals to zero uh, matters. Okay. So, uh, so there's a more precise statement, more precise. The more precise uh, statement is this, that the TIV, the degree of the HIV, okay, the TIV can be bounded above by the maximum of TI sigma V plus one and TI minus one sigma V plus two and so on until T naught sigma v plus i plus one so this is a more precise uh, statement okay and this more precise statement uh, is proved by induction on i for all oi modules v at the same time you so you, you prove uh, by induction on i for all for all oi modules v at the same time okay so uh so why can you prove by induction on i now, so you take the um, OI module V, okay, and you can write it as a quotient of some direct sum of free modules. Okay. 
and then you have a certain kernel W. So you have this short exact sequence. Okay, so you look at, look at this short exact sequence. So F in the middle is a direct sum of some free modules. So it is projective. Now it is projective, all the higher homology will be zero. Then you look at the long exact sequence induced by this uh, short exact sequence. So, so the long exact sequence on the homology will tell you that HIV is isomorphic to HI minus one W. Okay, right from the long exact sequence, you get HIV is HI minus one W. So then you use the induction hypothesis on HI minus one W. Okay, and then you get it bound in terms of some degree of the homology of sigma W. Okay, but now sigma is a exact functor. Okay, the shift functor is exact. So you get um this short exact sequence, and you can then uh, change H, T, you, get, you, you intend to change Ti's for sigma W back to Ti plus one for sigma V. Okay, so you can uh, go between V and W using uh, the two long exact sequences on homology that you get. Okay, uh, so this, uh, in this way, you prove the lemma by induction on I. Now, so the kappa V equals to zero uh, matters here because, um, so if you look, look at these two short exact sequences, uh, you have this uh, natural max going vertically. Okay. And then you can look at the co-kernel of the vertical maps. And that's your delta W to delta F to delta V to zero. Okay. But from delta W to delta F, you might have a kernel. That kernel is precisely, by the snake lemma, the kernel is precisely kappa V. Okay, so if kappa v is zero, then you have this short exact sequence. Okay, so if kappa v is zero, then you have this short exact sequence. So, um, so, so, so this is where kappa v equals to zero comes in. You, you, get, you get this short exact sequence, and then you can essentially do the same argument. Then you get regularity of v is bounded above by regularity of delta v plus one. Okay. Okay. So then uh, I'll state the next theorem. If I let B be the generating degree of V and I let R be greater or equal to the presentation degree of V. Okay, and I let V bar be the following. So I shift V by R times, sigma RV. And then I quotient away by the submodule ge generated by those which are less than D. Okay. So then the theorem says that kappa V bar is zero. So I'll make a short uh, discussion. I'm, I'm not going to write it down, but I'll make a short discussion about the corresponding result for FI modules, if you have seen it. So FI module shift theorem says that if you shift it uh, sufficiently many times, you get a FI module with a finite filtration whose successive quotients are induced modules. Now, so in the proved in uh, Napa's paper. Uh, so, so, so he looked at this uh, V bar and he proved that uh, the, the V bar uh, for, for FI module in the FI module case, uh, this V bar is an induced mod, is an induced FI module. Now for an OI module, uh, that you, you don't have that, but we are saying that uh, you can still show something and that is that kappa V bar is zero. So Fi module, V bar is going to be an induced mod, Fi module. But here is a weaker statement. It's a weaker statement, kappa V bar is zero. Okay. Now, uh, if there is time at the end of the talk, I will say a bit about uh, 
how theorem two is proved. Okay. But uh, for now, uh, uh, let me discuss how theorem two uh, leads to theorem one. Okay, so we use our uh, induction on the generating degree of V. Okay. Use induction on a generating degree of V. Now, so from kappa V bar is equals to zero, you get immediately the regularity of V bar is at most the regularity of delta V bar plus one. Okay, so now um, you have this, uh, the, the, the definition of V bar is by this quotient, right? So you have the short exact sequence. Okay, so yeah, this short exact sequence. Now, so the generating degree of V is D. Now, if you shift R terms, you get sigma RV. The generating degree of sigma RV cannot be more than D, it must be less than or equals to D. So this means that the generating degree of V bar is also less than or equals to D. And so when you take the derivative, the generating degree of delta V bar is less than or equals to D minus one. Okay, so it's less than or equals to D minus one. Okay, but then if you look at the presentation degree of delta V bar, okay, so you can apply the uh, delta, delta is right as that. Okay, so you get um, this, The, okay, so 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 from this is it's not hard to see that the presentation degree of delta v bar can be bounded in terms of r. Okay, so, so first the the presentation degree of v is bounded above by uh, is less than or equals to r. Then you can then show that if you know how to bound the presentation degree of v, then you know how to bound the presentation degree of shift of v. And so you can bound the presentation degree of sigma RV by uh, above by in terms of R. And then when you take delta, you can also bound it in terms of R. Okay, so that's not a problem. So that's something you we can check quite easily. Okay, and then um so 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 but and, and and so now the point is this that the presentation degree of delta V bar can be bounded in terms of R. Okay, but its generating degree is bounded above by d minus one. So you can use the induction hypothesis. You can use the induction hypothesis. And the induction hypothesis uh, tells you that the regularity of delta v bar, regularity of delta v bar can be bounded uh, in terms of d and r. It can be bounded in terms of d and r. Okay. And so that means regularity of v bar can be bounded in terms of d and r. Okay. Okay. Now, um, then, so, so now you so 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 now you look at uh, this short exact sequence. So on in, in this short exact sequence on the the, the the term on the right. So you know how to bound its regularity by d and r. Okay. So this one is okay. The term on the left is generated in degree less than or equals to d minus one, because you choose it to be less than d, the, those generated by less than d, okay? So I want to use um, induction hypothesis on the term on the left, okay? I want to use induction hypothesis on the term on the left. But to do that, I want to know that its presentation degree is also, can also be bounded in terms of r. I want to know that the term on the left, the presentation degree can also be bounded in terms of r, okay? But from this short exact sequence, you can get the T1, sigma RV less than D, um, is at most the maximum of T1, sigma RV, and T2 V bar from the long exact sequence. Okay? From the long exact sequence on homology, you, 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 you get this. So this is already okay, because I know I can bound the regularity of V bar in terms of D and R. This is also okay. It's just uh, shifting V. 
So you can also bound its presentation degree in terms of R. So this means that uh, I can bound the presentation degree of this R sigma RV less than D in terms of R. Okay. So then I use induction hypothesis. Induction hypothesis that says that the regularity of uh, this term on the left is okay. I can bound it in terms of D and R. Okay. So then you look at the long exact sequence in homology. It means that the term in the middle is okay as well. You can also bound its regularity in terms of D and R. Okay. And then by the lemma above, you, you, you can get that the regularity of V is at most regularity of sigma RV plus R, right? You shift R times every time you plus one. Okay, so this is okay. So the term on the left is okay as well. So this means you can bound it in terms of D and R, okay? So basically that's the argument. You, okay, so this is the argument. So, okay, so, 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 so of course, um, if you carry out this argument and you keep track of all this, how the, what, what you need to, the bounds you get, it's some kind of recursive uh, formula. And so it doesn't give a very nice formula, but you get this very big formula from this recursion, okay? Okay. Now next, uh, I want to uh, discuss a theorem that also comes from theorem two. So, the, uh, yeah, so from this theorem two. Okay. So this uh, next theorem says that if you take an OI module V that is presented in finite degrees, if you take an OI module V that is presented in finite degrees, and you shift it many, many times, Okay, you shift it sufficient number of times. There is uh, some kind of stability. There is some kind of stability. Okay, so I'll describe it. Let V be presented in finite degrees. Then there exists an integer N and OI modules. V1, V2 to Vs such that, okay, um, so this uh, V1, V2 to Vs is uh, some collection of OI modules. I'm going to uh, denote this collection uh, by Fv, okay, Fv, uh, such that for every n greater or equals to n, if you shift V n times, sigma n V, then sigma n V has a finite filtration where each successive quotient is isomorphic to V i for some i. So if you shift it sufficiently number of times, there is some collection of Fi modules. It has a finite future. There is some collection of Fi modules such that of, of oh, sorry, of OI modules such that if you shift it sufficiently many times, there is always a filtration where the successive quotients are belongs to this family. Okay, so this uh, some kind of stability under shifts. Okay. Uh, Yeah, so, okay, so, so uh, let, let me discuss uh, why. Uh, uh, argument is pretty simple. And if you know the argument, the result is uh, not impressive at all. <laughs> so the, the, the point is that uh, you don't have, uh, you, we are not saying anything about this V1, V2 to Vs. Sorry, uh, we are not saying that V1, V2 to Vs is anything nice. We are just saying that, they are, that, that it, it stays in this way. Okay, so. So the argument is uh, again induction on the generating degree of V. Okay, so the generating degree of uh, delta V bar is uh, strictly less than the generating degree of V. So by induction hypothesis, delta V bar is okay. See, so it's okay. That means 
there is some integer n that works for delta v bar, and you have some collection of modules uh, for delta v bar. You have some uh, this collection of modules f of for delta v bar. Okay. Uh, so from delta v bar, I will show that the statement is true for v bar. It's true for v bar. Okay. So to see that it's true for v bar, so you have this uh, short exact sequence. The kappa v bar is zero. So kappa v bar is zero means I have this sh uh, short exact sequence. V bar to sigma v bar to delta v bar to zero. Okay, so if you take this and you shift it n times, you get sigma n v bar, sigma n plus one v bar to sigma n delta v bar to zero. Okay, the term on the right has a finite filtration that works. Okay. It has a finite filtration where the successive quotient comes from the family for delta v bar. So the left term on the right, you have this few finite filtration. Now, I can't do anything, uh, uh, or at least I can't think of what to do with this, this term on the left. So I'm just going to take this term on the left and make it one of the members of this collection that I will use for v bar. So, okay, so what I'm saying is this, I'm going to take the collection for v bar to be the collection for uh, delta v bar and sigma n v bar, okay? So this n here is fixed. It is the one for uh, delta v bar. It is the n that works for delta v bar. So, um, so I get a filtration on sigma n plus one v bar. For sigma n plus one v bar, the, 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 the smallest piece, the smallest piece is sigma n v bar. And then uh, the other pieces comes from the pre-image of the filtration on sigma n delta v bar. Okay. So I get a filtration in the middle. Now, if I do a shift again, then I get sigma n plus one v bar to sigma n plus two v bar to sigma n plus one delta v bar to zero. So this term on the right is okay, right? Mm, it has the is del delta v bar, so we have the filtration. And this term on the left here, that's just what I had earlier in the middle. And it has this, this term, I, I, I already know I have, I have a filtration that works. So I have a filtration on the left here, and on the right, so I get a filtration in the middle, okay? And so you do induction and you get uh, that, 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 that this family here works for V bar, okay? And then from V bar, you can get the, uh, the, the, the same statement works for V. It works for V because um, you have uh, the definition of V bar means we have this uh, short exact sequence. Okay, so this is from the definition of v bar. So on the right here, you are okay. We just uh, check it. You have a filtration that you can have a filtration under sufficiently many shifts. On the left here, this is generated in degree less than d. So by induction hypothesis, you, you are okay. If you shift it many times, you can always find a filtration. So then this means that it works in the middle as well. It works in the middle as well. So, Mm. This means, but the term in the middle is shift r shift v r times. If, if it works for sigma r v, then it works it works for v. Okay, so this means you can take the collection for v to be the collection for sigma r v less than d union the collection for mm, v bar. Okay, and that's the proof of the of, of the theorem. All right. So actually, you can uh, see some of patterns to this kind of arguments, and if you have some properties satisfying some conditions, you can basically run through the same argument by induction on generating degree. Right. Okay. So it's a strategy that can work for other properties. 
Okay, but now uh, let me talk about the proof of theorem two. So this is the key ingredient, right? The statement, let me remind you, says that kappa v bar is zero. Okay. Um, now, I, 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 so, so the, the, the proof is uh, very explicit. You have to look at generators and see what happens. So I, I'm not going to uh, describe in, uh, so, so, so I, I want to just describe the idea in a simple situation and I'll make some very drastic simplification. Okay. So um, let's say V is generated by just one element. Then you can write it as a V as a quotient of MD. And then there will be some kernel W. So let's say V can be generated by just one element in position D. Then you can write a short exact sequence like this. Okay. Uh, to describe the idea, I'm going to, uh, let's just assume W is also generated by some element, which, I, which is in fact just a morphism from, let's say, D to R. Okay. So let's say W is generated by just one morphism, W from D to R. Okay, then uh, I want to get uh, go to V bar. To go to V bar, I first uh, apply the shift functor R times. So I get zero to sigma R W to sigma R M D to sigma R V to zero. Now the term in the middle, if I shift it R times, so if you recall, if I shift MD once, shift of MD is MD plus MD minus one. So you shift it R times, if you shift it R times, you are going to keep a copy of MD, but you are going to get some other uh, free modules, D prime where D prime is strictly less than D. So I'll collect all these together and call them Q. So it will be MD direct sum Q, where Q is basically the part which is generated by all the things less than D. Okay. So now uh, V bar is a quotient of sigma RV by all the things which are generated in by the part that is less than D. And that is precisely the image of Q in, in, in here. V bar is the quotient of sigma R V by the image of Q. Okay. So I can uh, write it in this way. I can first take a projection to MD and V bar is a certain quotient of MD. Okay. And then the kernel is the image of sigma R W in MD. Let's call that W hat. Okay. So you get this uh, diagram. Uh, so and you have this uh, short exact sequence at the bottom. Okay. So this uh, short exact sequence at the bottom. And uh, the key observation in the proof, the key observation in the proof is this, that W hat, I can describe the sum, I, I can describe, I, I can say something about generators of W hat. That's the key observation in the proof. And what we say is this, that W hat is generated by some u such that u stands the smallest element to the smallest element. U, so I'll write one for the smallest element. So u stand the smallest element to the smallest element. Okay, so by some uh, morphism. In, so elements in MD are morphisms. Okay, uh, actually linear combinations of morphisms, but let's forget about linear combinations. I'll just say via the element. Okay. Um, then, uh, so 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 I want to say how I how I picture this. Now, so I'm afraid that what I say in the next uh, few minutes here might not make much sense because it's really intuition or how I think about this. But if you have thought about the proof of this for fi modules, then you will see this that is really the same. I'm really do, looking at the same thing. Because I don't have the symmetric group acting, I can't make the same kind of statements. But the, if you have studied the proof of this for FI modules, I'm doing completely the same thing. Okay. 
So uh, what happens is this, right? So, so you have, uh, let's say this set with D elements and then you have the W, the generator of my W to, R, to a set with R elements. Okay, but now you look at MD, the shift sigma R M R D uh, and at N. So what is this guy at N? It is M D R plus N, okay? So, uh, so I have these R points where I, these are the R points that I add when I do the shift. And then I have this uh, N that I'm looking at. So one, two, three to N, okay? So we shift by R times, okay? So we shift by R times. So let me mm, draw a line here, okay? So uh, MDR plus N, an element in MDR, plus, a, a basis element in MDR plus N is an injection from D to, 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 to the right, to, to the set on the right, right? So, okay, so um, if I look at this uh, W, a generator for my uh, W, so how do I get other things? So in W, I have to apply morphisms to my generator. So I apply some morphism, let's say F, to uh, MDR plus N, okay? So F, W, so F, W is something else in the OI module W, okay? So OI module W will be spanned by things like this. Okay, so now I look at where the smallest element go, right? The smallest element in here, so this is one. So one will go to some W1. One will go to some W1. Now, F is going to take W1 to something in R plus N. Now, if it lands, if it, if it lands above the red line, if it lands above the red line, then it's actually something in Q that you caution away. So those does not matter. Okay, so those are not, does not really matter. So the things that matter are things that goes, uh, is order F such that it takes W1 to something below the red line. If it goes above the red line, it's going to end up in Q. You are going to caution it away. Okay. But the, the ones that don't end up in Q, but end up, end up in MD are the F such that F of W1 is below the red line. Okay, so then uh, you want to say that, uh, so, 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 so then I want to say the following. I, want, I can factorize F as a product of two composition. So that uh, the first compass, the first morphism take W1 to one. Okay, so I, 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 I factor F so that by some G that takes W1 to one and then some other H and it will take that to where I want it to be. Okay, so let me write that down. So what I claim is that I can uh, find, find H and G so that F is HG and F W is HG W. Okay, so find H and G so that F W is HG W. Okay. Mm. Okay, so this is where uh, is really a difference between OI and FI. So it, in, in FI, you will say you I want to bring the image of FW, image of FW and end up end up there. And you want to say I can bring it as far left as possible. And I can actually do that for FI. You can bring it back up so so so, so that you, you, um, you get something uh, with D elements there. And then that's how you conclude that for FI you get an induced module. V bar is an induced module. But here I can't because I need to keep the order. So all I can, but, but I can still say that I can bring it as far left as possible so that the smallest element uh, is pushed until it's the smallest element uh, just below the red line, okay? So then, uh, 
this means that uh, so I, I have a G such that G W one is one. Okay, so that's uh, what I want from from G. Okay, so I'm going to call this element G W call it U. Okay, and so so that is the U in the claim here. The, the, the W hat is generated by some U such that U one is one. Okay, now if you have this make if you make this observation, if you make this observation, then um. You, you, you can prove that uh, kappa v bar is zero because kappa is the kernel of uh, v bar to sigma v bar. Okay. So I pick an element v bar in here. So what is iota? Iota is the one that sends r, some number r to r plus one, right? So that's the iota, the morphism that uh, induces your homomorphism from v bar to the sheaf of v bar. Okay, so I pick a, a v bar in the kernel. I take a V by the kernel. I can write this uh, by a representative in MD. And to say that it is in the kernel means that iota V should be in W hat. Okay, it should be in W hat. So the short exact sequence up here. Okay, okay but what does that mean? So it means iota V can be written as some alpha U. Now, but iota is going to send one to two, two to three, and so on. So this means that alpha one must be bigger than one. Alpha must send one to something bigger than one. But that means I can write alpha as some iota beta u. I can write alpha in this uh, as iota of some beta. But iota is uh, on MD is injective. Iota is injective on MD. So this means that V must be beta u. But beta u is in w hat. So v is in w hat, which is what you want to check. So kappa v bar is zero. Okay. So basically, that, that is the idea of the proof. Or for, 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 for basically, you look at this picture. All right. Uh, so that's all uh, I plan to talk. So thank you. Let's thank our speaker. Do we have any questions? So in this uh, this first result that you said, where you had this uh, like doubly exponential uh, bound, uh, I mean, what is what is your intuition as far as like like do you do you expect the optimal answer to be something like linear, or is is this sort of really harder than? than the FI case in some way, like, is it maybe, do you, would you guess exponential? Uh, what, what, what is your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I don't know. Uh, I, I am not optimistic that it is linear. So I, I, I'm not optimistic that it is, it is linear. Uh, and uh, I don't know whether it will be exponential or quadratic or what, I don't, that I don't know. Uh, I, don't think I, uh, uh, I I don't think that this is any in any way optimal. I, I think that maybe you can improve the two to some number bigger than one. <laughs> but that is kind of something I don't see much point for me to try to do. So I yeah so <laughs> yeah so I uh, uh, yeah I don't know. Can I supplement that question with? Do you have any? Uh, examples of OI modules that don't come from restrictions of FI modules and have a completely different behavior in terms of growth or? Okay, uh, not in terms of growth, but let's say uh, you can have an OI module. So, so let's say you have an FI module, then uh, if, it, if it is uh, presented in finite degree, then you can see that uh, eventually, uh, if you go from Vn to Vn plus one by some induced map by some injection, that has to be injective on Vn. The torsion degree is bounded above. But for OI, uh, it is possible to keep having some elements that goes to zero. So for example, you can uh, just take 
at every position from one, two, three onwards, you just put the ring K, you just put K, 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 K. So, and the induced map from VN to v, v, some VM to VN is uh, identity map if you send the biggest element to the biggest element and everything else act by zero. Okay, so then one can check this is actually presented in finite degree and that, but at, no matter how many times you shift, you are always going to get things that still act by zero. Thanks. But the groove is the same as for FI. I mean, it's polynomial in N if you are finally generated over a few. Do you know examples that the regularity is more than the church Ellenberg bound? No, I never really try to compute any regularity. <laughs> Yeah, I have a question. So, uh, is the fact that OI modules have finite regularity, does that, like, when was that proven? Was it proven in this or was it known before that? Okay. Uh, OI modules, which are finitely generated over a Noiderian ring, we know that it has finite regularity by another argument. That's also in a paper I wrote with Li Ping Li. But that was some years ago. Actually, I gave this talk two years ago in the Midwest Representation Stability Workshop. That's the thing I talk about then. Uh, yeah. But here uh, is a stronger statement. So, so in this case, I think that uh, if it's presented in finite degrees over any ring, uh, it's not previously known that it is uh, finite. So you don't use you don't need to use the fact that you don't need to a priori know that it has finite regularity to run all of your arguments. Yeah. Nice. Right. Um, I'll add one thing to that. Um, so Sam again, Turkin and, and I uh, wrote this paper on OI modules where we um, proved a lot about the structure of them. We proved a lot of fine results. And uh, we were able to prove finiteness of regularity in that paper. I don't know when that paper occurred relative to the, the first uh, paper that you were referring to, uh, Hui Peng Li. Um, but we did try really hard to prove a theorem like the one, the main theorem in this talk, a regularity bound, and, and we couldn't get it with our methods. So um, yeah, I, I, we were missing something, I guess, um, with these kinds of shift arguments. Yes, I tried very hard to understand your paper. Your paper. <laughs> yeah, I tried to, to see because, how uh, Yeah, at the time, somewhat different language from the right, category. Right. Right. Yeah, and I tried to recast this argument in our setting, and I wasn't, I didn't really make much progress with it. Do we have any more questions? If not, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.